Ecclesiastes means to gather for an important message or an important purpose. Why is Solomon calling us to get together in this book? Because Solomon wrote this about 900 or so B.C. Remember, he was the smartest, most powerful, richest man who ever lived. He had the political, legal, and financial ability to do whatever he wanted to. Can you imagine that? Having either the credit card or whatever it might be, or the legal green light to say, hmm, I want that, and it's yours. That yacht, that building, those people gone, whatever it might be. Solomon was in that position. Unlimited finances, respect, learning, parties, drugs, alcohol, women, 700 wives, 300 concubines. Oh, by goodness. Was he supposed to go anywhere near that stuff? No. God says, when you have a king, Israel, make sure for sure they do not multiply to themselves horses, gold, or wives. Uh, what did Solomon step over the line on? All three of those. And don't forget also his mom, Bathsheba, warned Solomon as well in Proverbs chapter 31. So what happened? Solomon barely survives it. He uh, gathers, therefore, everyone around him and says, I got to tell you more about this. Chapter 2, verse 1. So I said in my heart, come now, and I will test you with mirth. Therefore, enjoy pleasure. But surely this is also vanity. Remember, the word vanity here is not sort of like a pride of some kind. It means there's no substance to it. It's cotton candy. It's a vapor. Solomon had everything he wanted, and he still felt a certain emptiness. Remember last week in chapter 1, right around verse 15, he tried filling the void with philosophy. Discovered, no matter what people know, no matter how smart people are, even Plato, etc., all those people, was it Plato who said, know thyself? I don't even know myself. The Bible says that none of us know ourselves. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is destruction. Solomon figured out, as he studied all the philosophies of his day, that all human philosophy cannot keep people from doing evil. So that was vanity. Then last week in verse 16, he tried filling the void with education. So he got all kinds of college degrees. He went to Harvard like 12 times. And then he hopped over the pond and went to Oxford, whatever. Solomon was a botanist, a biologist, an astronomer, expert on fish. He was an ichthyologist, ick. <laughs> and he was an expert on the sea, says the Bible. He wrote books. He wrote plays, as we'll see tonight. He wrote poems and proverbs. Most of the proverbs in uh, your Bible, what's the old adage? A proverb a day, there's 31 proverbs, so you know... 30 proverbs for the, the months with the 30 days and 31 proverbs uh, for the months that have 31 days because the proverb a day keeps the stupid away. He wrote proverbs and songs and he said even that, as we'll see tonight, vanity. So now Solomon's third attempt to fill the void. Laughter, verse two. So I said of laughter, I'll just laugh myself silly. Madness. The actual word there means there's no point. And of mirth, what does it accomplish? Had some fun with this one today. According to worldmetrics.org, last year Americans spent $8 billion with a B for stand-up comedy shows and streaming stand-up comedy shows. Eight billion dollars. Comedy clubs in America average revenues of more than 300 million dollars a year. Cable's Comedy Central is estimated to be in over 100 million households. The top five comedy podcasts combine for 50 million downloads a month. And do you know what the most searched for 
categories in movies on Netflix and Hulu, guess what it is? It's comedy. The fastest growing genre on Amazon Prime is comedy, up 42% over last year. Hey, people love to laugh. And statistically, at least, we're laughing more than we ever have. Mm -hmm. Yet according to the National Institute of Mental Health, suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in America. Suicide is the second leading cause of death, ages 10 to 14, and fifth leading cause of death for those ages 35 to 44. Do you know that last year, 21 million adults had at least one major depressive episode last year? 10.3% of U.S. women reported that, and 6.3% of human men reported at least one major depressive episode this last year. 18.6% of U.S. adults between the ages of 18 and 25. Pretty amazing. Have you seen the commercial that says, um, hey, is your anti-depression medicine not really doing the job? Here's some more medicine on top of your antidepressive stuff. Um, I'm not a doctor, uh, but I'm wondering if there's lots of folks in America who are laughing their way through their comedy channels, but is it really touching what is really bothering them? According to Solomon, nope. Laughter is madness and mirth. What does it accomplish? Changing just a bit uh, direction, 13.5% of U.S. Uh, people 12 years and older have used illicit drugs in the last 30 days. Um, last count, population of America is approximately 335 million. That's 4.5 million people, 12 years in age and older, have used illicit drugs in the last 30 days. Out of all those who drink alcohol, 20% suffer from alcohol addiction. And all addictions are rising at 3.8% year after year. Laughing by itself does not result in lasting joy. What does or where do you get your love, joy, peace? Only from being born again and filled with the Spirit. Most comedians, if you didn't know, did you know that most comedians, maybe I should say a high percentage of comedians, consistently battle with depression? Did you know that? True story. They battle with depression, mental health, and even suicide. It's called the sad clown paradox. Fascinating. Laugh, laugh, laugh. Because remember, happiness depends on what's happening. So if I'm watching something with great amusement, I feel better for a second. But like Solomon is saying, that didn't quell the yearning. It didn't fill the void in my heart, said Solomon. Verse 3. So I searched in my heart how to gratify my flesh with wine, and implied, and that didn't work either, while guiding my heart with wisdom and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the sons of men to do under heaven all the days of their lives. It was all a vapor, no substance, no true fulfillment. So now next, what's Solomon going to turn to next? He's going to turn to hobbies, projects, and programs. That'll do it, you know. It's classic. If my hands and my mind are busy enough, that'll fill the void. Does it? Let's check it out. Verse 4. So I made my works great. I built myself houses and planted myself vineyards. Um, we saw in the Old Testament book of First and Second Kings um, what kind of house Solomon built, and it was absolutely amazing. Um, they called it the forest. He transplanted trees inside the lobby of his house. It was stunning beyond measure. And people from all over the world, including the Queen of Sheba, in her own right, was very wealthy. What's going on there in Jerusalem? 
We heard about this Zillow.com house of yours. We better go check it out. And she was blown away. So I did that. I planted myself vineyards, verse 5. I made myself gardens and orchards, and I planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. And I made myself water pools from which to water the growing trees of the grove. Some of those you can read about in your Old Testament book. It was truly amazing. The Babylonian hanging gardens of Hammurabi had nothing on Solomon's living sort of um, menagerie of plants and animals that lived in his own house. Truly amazing. How about that? Vanity. Cotton candy. Got a lot of stuff done. Lots of people are saying, wow, you're sure cool and handy to have around. But I still feel empty. Next, what he's going to try. I know. How about business enterprises and growing an empire? Well, that should really do it. Check it out. Verse 7. So then I acquired male and female servants. Read that employees. Man, did I have a business concern. And had servants born into my house. Yes, I had greater possessions of herds and flocks than all who were in Jerusalem before me. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the special treasures of kings and of the provinces. I acquired male and female singers, the delights of the Son of Men, and musical instruments of all kind. He signed up for Amazon Entertainment, Hulu, and all of the pay-per-view channels. What he actually did here was he got into entertainment. He hired actors and actresses and musicians, and he wrote plays. He was the Spielberg of his day. Let's pack the amphitheaters with all kinds of entertainment. And when everybody is applauding or weeping or laughing out loud at what I wrote and what is being performed, that will set my spirit soaring. He's going to say it here, and it did for a minute. Verse 9, so I became great and excelled more than all who were before me in Jerusalem. I'll make art. We would say, I'll make movies. A whole lot of people are into that flow and um, very creative people on all sides, both sides of the camera, in the theater, etc. Um, if you've ever caught the acting bug or the performance sort of uh, flow, it really is quite thrilling. It's a, it's a thrilling experience. Um, years ago, Nicole and I were uh, tasked, I'd say tasked, but it wasn't a task, it was a lot of fun. We, we were supposed to write and produce a live action stunt show with live actors at the Silver Legacy. Do any of you remember that? Do you remember? It's been... 20 plus years ago, Nicole and I wrote, art directed, the mind shed at the Silver Legacy. We had a hundred, two hundred plus thousand dollar budget. We hired actors. We built staging. At one time, one of our actors was to fall. There was pyrotechnics flying around and, uh, one actor fell 45 feet of free fall. That's a lot of alliteration, isn't it? He free fell 45 feet. At one time, we were the highest free fall daily stunt show in America at the Silver Legacy. Pyrotechnics, boom, pow. And I'll never forget our opening night. You remember that? The press was there. How much fun did we have? Woo-hoo. And then, like any Christmas present, you pretty soon kind of, in a little while, you're playing with the box. <laughs> Is entertainment a powerful medium to move the heart? And those who have been trained, Nicole is, uh, is formally trained in theater, And we are the first to tell you um, it is exhilarating for a minute and moving a large audience of people to tears or laughter is a sort of powerful sort of feeling and effect. 
But even that can grow stale. I looked this up because I was curious. I'll make movies, said Solomon. I'll tell gripping stories that move people. And I'll cry when they cry and laugh when they laugh. And I'll hear that amphitheater full of applause. I bet they were fabulous. I was curious, so I looked it up. You know the top five grossing films of all time? Number five, brrr, Star Wars, episode seven, The Force Awakens, at $2.071 billion. Number four, Titanic, $2.7 billion. Number three, Avatar, The Way of Water, $2.32 ba -ba -ba, ba -ba 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 billion. Number two, what do you think it is? <laughs> It's Avengers Endgame at 2.8 billion. And the number one movie, gross of all time, brrr, Avatar at 3 billion. That's just what you call gross or theatrical release. And of course, what are they making on all these pay per view channels? And the point of it is whether you're James Cameron, uh, Spielberg, or George Lucas, Solomon's friends were impressed for a moment, entertained for a moment, but largely left the theater and went back to their typical lives. And I read you some of the typical lives in America. They go to these movies too, and they are thrilled, and that's why we pay the money. Please take my emotions for a rigorous ride around the emotional track. But then I go home and I'm largely unchanged. Academy Awards piling up in Solomon's closet, his wealth skyrocketing, respect for his talent revered. But Solomon too, like his adoring audiences, is largely unchanged. Also, my wisdom remained with me, he goes on to say, and that's what God had given him that very first, there in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 10. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I looked at everything. Um, he didn't have the internet like we do today, and on a phone, on, with an internet connection, what is possible to be viewed? Anything and everything. Absolutely. Solomon, of course, uh, he had the wherewithal for a command performance or whoever it might be. He was uniquely situated. He literally could force people or circumstances and situations to view whatever he wanted. Gladiatorial events, perhaps. Certainly crazy sexual whatevers. Violence of any kind, whatever he wanted. He did not keep from his eyes. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure, for my heart rejoiced for a moment in all my labor. And this was my reward for, from all of my labor, inferring a moment of satisfaction and accomplishment. Verse 11, then I looked on all the work that my hands had done and on the labor in which I had toiled. And indeed, all of it was a vapor, a grasping for the wind. There is no profit under the sun, verse 12. Then I turn myself to consider, I'm going to compare wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the man do who succeeds the king? Only what he has done already. In other words, who would be better at this task than me, a king? Verse 13. Then I saw that wisdom excels folly as light excels darkness. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. Yet I myself perceive that the same event happens to them all. You know what he's saying is, wise or foolish, okay, wise people are going to live a little better life, but at the end, what happens to everyone? I checked it out. Did you know that the mortality rate here in Washoe County is 100%? Everybody dies. That's what he's saying. Wise people may live a little bit better for a while, but eventually everybody dies. Verse 15. 
So I said in my heart, as it happens to the fool, it also happens to me that everyone dies. And why was I then more wise? What's the use? Then I said to my heart, that also is vanity. As I said, wisdom will live a little better life, but wise and fool share the same fate. So in the long run, what good is my wisdom in the long run? Verse 16, for there is no more remembrance of the wise than of the fool forever since all that now is will be forgotten in the days to come. And how does a wise man die? Same way that a fool does. Um, I was going to use my Abraham Lincoln second inaugural address photo again. You don't have to look it up unless it's right there at your fingertips. Well, there it is. I showed that last week. Pretty cool, right? That is the nearly completed Capitol building or the first portion of the Capitol building. It's not done yet. And so who is that guy right there? Oh, there's the $5 bill guy. There he is. Then I said last week, can any of you name any other face there? And if you've been watching the Democratic National Convention from Chicago, the who's who, um, President Obama and Ms. Obama spoke last night. I think... Uh, President Clinton is going to talk tonight, but the point of it is the who's who of the Democratic Party, the honchos, the rich people, those that necessarily maybe don't want to be on camera, but the billionaires, all those people at the Democratic National Convention are hugely important. But if the Lord tarries in a hundred years, nobody cares. See that there? All those people, you couldn't get that ticket, you couldn't get that close, unless you were a major honcho. Lincoln's second inaugural address in 1865, and within a month, he is going to be dead. Shot, Ford's Theater. Inauguration, thank you, Chris. Inauguration, March the 4th, 1865. That, that picture always moves me because at one time those people were so important. And last week I quoted uh, Mark Twain. The cemetery is full of indispensable men. <laughs> Solomon said, what's it all about? Wiser fool, years from now, nobody cares. Now, Solomon is right for those under the sun. Who's under the sun? Well, where the humans are. Above the sun, at least metaphorically speaking, that's where God lives. Solomon, in his kind of depression, is all he can see is what he can see. And he's right. Under the sun, who cares? But in eternity, wisdom and folly matters a great deal. In hell, right now, are some of those people. Well, Jesus actually said that wide is the way that leads to destruction, and many there are that go through. At one time, the best houses, the best food, the best respect, college professors, powerful politicians, and military leaders. The social... Um, Influencers, they're there too. And now, all of that matters nothing to them. What does matter now is which one of those received the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross for their sin. Now it really matters. In hell right now, those that were foolish enough to reject God's love are deeply regretting their folly. And in heaven... Right now, all of those are overflowing with indescribable joy. And everyone in heaven right now is consumed with gratitude and rejoicing that they made the wise choice to receive Jesus. Thank you, Chris. Your fingers are quick. We sure appreciate that. Verse 17. See, Alan, I told you we weren't going to get to chapter 13, chapter 3 today. 
We're going to probably end with chapter 2, so let's check out verse 17. Therefore I hated life because the work that was done under the sun was distressing to me. All that stuff that I did, all those movies I wrote, all the buildings I built, all the wealth that I accumulated, it's all distressing to me. For all is vanity. In other words, it's, there's, there's no substance. And grasping for the wind, verse 18. And then I hated all my labor in which I had toiled under the sun because I must leave it to the man who will come after me. Um, Chuck Swindoll used to say, I've never seen a hearse hauling a U-Haul. Um, the, old, the old adage of um, uh, J. Paul Getty at one time was the Jeff Bezos of his day. And it was said that uh, at his huge and expensive wake, somebody sidled up next to J. Paul Getty's accountant and slurping his drink, he said, come on, come on. How much did the old man leave behind? And, and the accountant, he left it all behind. <laughs> and who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. I made so much money, I couldn't spend it in my lifetime, so now I'm going to give it to somebody else. Yet he will rule over all my labor in which I toiled and in which I have shown myself wise under the sun. I worked hard for all that stuff. I applied myself intellectually with expertise and acumen. Will the next guy, will he even care? That also is vanity. Most of us look at the rich or the handsome or the beautiful or the famous or the successful, the artistic and the talented. Nicole and I love to watch the Academy Awards. Um, those are the beautiful people, all right, you know. Many of us look at those people and we firmly believe, hmm, you know, maybe if I had some of that, maybe, you know, my life would be a bit more fulfilling. The enemy then places or plays off that fable. If that's not you, then I imagine it's perhaps many the enemy knows that, so then he tricks people to exhaust their lives chasing those things. And we must believe what Solomon said, you guys. He says it so right here. He says it right here. He's saying, I was all of that. I had all of that. I accomplished more than anyone ever did. It was a vapor, no lasting substance, and I still felt empty. Can you, will you hear the lonely whine of the top dog? And that's what the top dog is saying. Verse 20. Therefore I turned my heart, that is to say, I gave up and despaired of all the labor in which I had toiled under the sun. For there is a man whose labor is with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, yet he must leave his heritage to a man who has not labored for it. This also is vanity, and it's a great evil, he said. Well, what do you mean? Well, Solomon is saying that even if I work my whole life away with wisdom and skill, I amass great wealth, then I just give it to somebody else who didn't work for it? He says, that's not good. Um, I found this fascinating. Did you know that uh, one-third... One third of lottery winners declare bankruptcy within three to five years. Now, what does that mean? Often, folks who do accumulate wealth, if it's not inherited, they did have a very um, complete and compelling work ethic, and they were good at it, and they got through their setbacks and kept getting back up and going back in and showed tremendous focus and courage and bravery. You build wealth, that's one of the ways to do it. But if you don't, and all that wealth comes to you, you don't apply the same discipline. So that makes sense to me that one third of lottery winners declare bankruptcy within three to five years. And virtually all lottery winners say that they experienced significant disruption in their family and close relationships. A tremendous strain because everybody wanted a piece of that wealth. And they had to formulate good boundaries and say, no. And you guys know this, right? 
everybody's your friend when you're telling them yeah. You want to know who's really interested in doing the right thing? Tell someone no. See how they handle that. Solomon has one son that we are aware of. 700 wives, 300 concubines. There's only one son that's mentioned in the scripture. His name is Rehoboam. Solomon had a son. And Rehoboam proved to be exceedingly foolish. Did you know that? Through Rehoboam and his college cronies, when Solomon passes away, the responsibility falls upon Rehoboam, and then he proves himself to be selfish and self-centered and completely insensitive to people. And he caused a tremendous rift in the people of Israel, which led into a civil war. Ten tribes rebel and go to the north, and for the next several generations, the next 19 kings, the northern ten tribes region becomes known as Judah, and idolatry comes into the land. Somebody cracks off a great idea. I got it. Hey, let's do that golden calf thing again. And nobody said, you remember how that worked out the last time? And idolatry even snuck into the southern two tribes region called Judah. Israel to the north, Judah to the south, and Rehoboam played a major part in driving a wedge right in the middle of the nation of God. Solomon is saying, so then what's the use of making more money than I could ever spend in my life and then through inheritance ruin my son's life too? How empty is that? Verse 22. For what is man for all of his labor and for striving of his heart with which he has toiled under the sun? For all his days are sorrowful. In other words, hard work is hard. And his work burdensome. And even in the night his heart takes no rest. This also is vanity. For you business owners or those of you who have your own uh, sort of enterprise or practice, you know what that's like. When you punch a clock and you punch out, you can turn off your brain. And then go home and usually <laughs> complain about the boss. <laughs> right, Rick? <laughs> Favorite pastime of employees. What occupies most of the time and thoughts of wealthy people? Three guesses. Their wealth. Jesus, in fact, he said, where your treasure is, their soul will be your heart. An unsaved, under the sun person who works hard... Their days are focused on their project, their business, their practice. They have to, to, get, to have to apply a lot of effort and energy. Often it's at the expense of close relationship. Sometimes their families suffer for it. They often then go to bed restless, occupied with that project. Did you know that late in life, after he writes the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon then, in, in chapter 12, he finally sets it straight what is the end of everything? Not enterprise and not all that stuff. It's love God and keep his commandments. And late in life, Solomon would say to his son Rehoboam, it's in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 24. My son, let God's word not depart from your eyes. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. So they will be life to your soul. That's what uh, Solomon learned firsthand. And grace to your neck. <laughs> In other words, you're not going to get a broken neck. Then you will walk safely in your way and your foot will not stumble. Now check this out. And when you lie down, you will not be afraid. Yes, you will lie down and your sleep will be safe. Did you know that Solomon also wrote Psalm 127? And Psalm 127 verse 2 says, It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late just to eat the bread of sorrow. What he's saying there is you get up early for your job, your project, your enterprise. It is in vain to do all of that work, working hard, 
occupied with success, for the Lord gives his beloved sleep. Speaking of sleep, hold your finger here, Jeremy in the book of uh, Matthew, New Testament book of Matthew. I'm going to show you a sleeper. You guys want to see a sleeper? A sleeper. Matthew chapter 8, please. Matthew chapter 8. We're going to start with verse number 23. Matthew 8, please. What about the sleep thing? I might get a kick out of this. Matthew chapter 8, verse number 23. Now when he, Jesus, had gotten into the boat, his disciples followed him. And they're heading across the way, and where they're going to head up, where they're going to end up is, is at a place called Gadara. So, suddenly, verse 24, a great tempest, a great storm arose on the sea, so that the boat was covered with the waves. So what's happening is the waves are so huge, they are breaking over the bow of the ship, and it's filling up. And so the water's coming in, more so than they could bail it out with buckets. But Jesus was, what's your Bible say? Asleep. What? In that kind of storm? Somebody once said, a clean conscious is a soft pillow indeed. Verse 25, and his disciples came and awoke him. Hey, wake up, Lord. Lord, save us. And in another gospel, do you not care that we are perishing? Now, what was the mindset of the disciples? They made a living on this lake. They knew this lake very well. They had grown up on this lake. This storm was so huge that it frightened them to death. And they were using all of their accumulated nautical knowledge, and they were failing and the ship was filling with water. And everybody, understandably, was greatly agitated, except for who? Jesus. What is his sort of, um, what is he doing? He's sleeping. Don't you care that we are perishing? Verse 26. But he, Jesus, said to them, why are you fearful? And I imagine they're like, serious? Are you seeing the size of this storm? We are sinking, Jesus. All empirical evidence points to we aren't going to make it. What do you mean? Why are you fearful? Oh, you of little faith. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the waves. Circle rebuke. That is the Greek word epitemeo. Epitemeo, and it means honor, literally full honor. What? I believe that the translators had a hard time with this because we're reading English translations of the original Greek. I think they sort of poised over their inkwell for a minute. They went, how are we going to do this? Right in your margin, he rebuked. Right in your margin, Psalm 46, verse 10. Psalm 46, verse 10, written a thousand years before this big old storm. I'll read it to you. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations, those are the unsaved people, and I will be exalted in the earth. When Messiah shows up, Psalm 46, verse 10 says, he will have all power over all of the earth, and would that include wind and waves? So when he stands up and he rebuked Epitaneo, he means, you will honor me. Wind and waves? What do you mean honor him? He is invoking Psalm 46, verse 10. You will obey exactly what God's word said about you, and you will honor me. And what did all the wind and the waves do? 
That's a powerful time. Back to Ecclesiastes. Do you see how powerful that is? You will honor me, wind and waves. Why? Because a thousand years before I was born, Jehovah God prompted the psalmist to say, when Messiah shows up, he will be honored among the Gentiles and he will be honored in the creation itself. Because who made the creation? Jesus did. Fascinating. Then as you know, part of that wind and waves, that probably was not just an atmospheric sort of dislocation. That was probably a storm that was whipped up and it had a demonic sort of um, uh, backing behind it. Not all storms are from the devil or the devilish, but that storm was because after it lays down and they go to Gadara, who did they encounter? The man of the tombs. How many demons did he have floating around in his head? 6,000. Harvest, do you hear that? What do 6,000 voices in your head, what cacophony of white noise would that be? Please understand that. A guy with 6,000 discordant voices still had enough of his humanity to recognize Jesus and what Jesus could do and still had enough to say, save me, God. Even with 6,000 demons. That's probably why that storm was whipped up by the demonic. Back to the book of Ecclesiastes. Let's zoom to the end. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, and I'm kind while I'm doing that. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, meekness. What is meekness? Not weakness. Meekness is I have an ability to do whatever, but I choose not to. Is a horse stronger than the rider on top? Yes. Why does the horse obey the rider? That's a picture of meekness and, of course, self-control. Verse 24, so I, Solomon, decided that nothing is better for a man than that he should eat, drink, and that his soul should enjoy good in his labor. So he's saying it, it's not completely, um, he said under the sun where people live, um, residing, or I should say, Getting some uh, sense of, 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 uh, of satisfaction does come from a hard day's work. This also I saw, I realized that that kind of satisfaction was from the hand of God, verse 25. For who can eat or who can have enjoyment more than I? Solomon didn't just party away. He was a hard worker and he worked with wisdom and diligence. I know about that part of it, he says. Verse 26. For God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy to a man who is good in his sight. But to the sinner he gives the work of gathering and collecting that he may give to him who is good before God. This also is vanity and grasping at the wind. John Corson says this, Our Constitution tells us we are guaranteed the right to pursue happiness. <laughs> Yet as wonderful as that sounds politically, it is disastrous in reality. He's right on that one. For happiness will never be found by those who pursue it. But like a pot of gold at the end of a rainbow, the more I chase it, the quicker it flies away. In the last chapter, chapter 12 of the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon finally figures it out. He says, fear God. I figured it out. It's not the size of your bank account, square footage of your house, the car you drive, the spouse you have or do not. It's all about fear God. Keep his commandments for this is man's all. And nine centuries later, Jesus will say the same thing. He'll say this, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness 
and all of these things will be added to you. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand. You can take that off. Thank you, Chris. Your fingers are swift. Your database is extensive. Thanks for grabbing that picture. Lord Jesus, uh, no matter what station in life we find ourselves here tonight, Lord, it is such an important, important truth. Young people, people who've had plenty of birthdays, single, married, struggling with health or finances are doing quite well in those categories. It all comes down to this. When I get up in the morning, who's the first person I think about? When I'm drifting off to sleep at night, what's maybe some of the last thoughts in my mind? Solomon says, I did all of that, and it was vapor, and it was empty. And then I finally figured it out, and I tried to tell my son, but he wouldn't listen. Fear God, love him, trust him. We would say, fall on the rock. Give him the steering wheel and don't grab it back from him. Heaven is what we were designed for. Jesus said on Sunday, I go to prepare a place for you. And if if it were not so, I would have told you that I'm going to come and grab you and bring you so that you can live there and be with me. That's what we were designed for. Eternity with him. With that perspective, then says Solomon, then work diligently with honor and integrity. You will find some satisfaction under the sun, but the satisfaction and fulfillment of all ages and eternity, that's with Jesus the Messiah, the Christ, who was killed for our sins. By his stripes we are healed. And then he rose from the dead. Lord Jesus, we love you and we thank you for doing all of that for us. Come quickly, Lord. In Jesus' name, and now everybody said, amen. Amen. Hey, we'll see you on, uh, we'll see you on Sunday.